Yeah, my name is Sebastian Hermann. I'm also from AKSW, University Leipzig. Um, and I'm presenting uh, some work which has been done in the LOD2 project. Um, and um, so, first of all, what we needed, um, uh, the LOD2 project, uh, kind of like the main thing that the LOD2 project produces is the LOD2 stack. There's the ISWC and newspaper about it, basically a big software integration framework. And um, where you can uh, modify RDF and load data in it and refine it. And um, what we needed to do is we needed, uh, well, in the project we need some natural language processing. And uh, we had these, basically these two requirements to unlock natural language processing NLP for the project. Uh, the first one is the NLP tool output uh, needs to be in RDF because everything is in RDF, so you can reuse all the tools, Sparkle and queries, and combine it with, with your other data. And the second requirement was uh, scalability. Here, uh, less triples always helps, and um, there's also focus, the so the focus here is on really on usefulness uh, for, for, the, uh, for the other approaches. And this is why we developed uh, the NLP interchange format, uh, in short, NIF. Uh, it's an RDF owl based format uh, that aims to achieve interoperability between lang natural language processing tools, language resources, and annotations. And um, so the NIF was published, the first version, 1.0, was published in November 2011. And um, now currently we are working on version 2.0, which will hop hopefully be completed within 2012. Um, so here, here is a rough overview over the NLP interchange format. On the top, uh, you see the NLP tools and services. Um, the BOA is one of them. Um, then Stanford NLP, Fox, uh, or DBpedia Spotlight, or any other um, entity linking NLP tool like Semanta, OpenCalé. Um, the idea how to integrate this is to write an, a NIF wrapper that reads the NLP interchange format and outputs the NLP interchange format. So it's a software integration over a common data format. Uh, and in the middle, you see the three parts, the three major parts of the NLP interchange format. One part is the structural interoperability. Um, so this is uh, RDF and uh, the URI schemes, which I will present in this talk. In the middle part, uh, it's Middle part is about conceptual interoperability. This means uh, re basically that's reusing existing ontologies for NLP, uh, um, for the domain, NLP domain, natural language processing domain. Yeah. And the third part is the access interoperability. This basically standardizes the way um, the web services are, which, param which parameters they take, and uh, how, how, you should, how sh you should use them and implement them. And uh, so on, on the bottom, you basically see the data web, which should also be possible to be reused in natural language processing tools. So the, f the, the challenge, the first challenge is um, addressing primary data. I think you, uh, I mean, I, I would say you should have seen that, that uh, this web page already uh, at some time in your career. Um, and now, if you want to um, like annotate a part of it, let's say this, uh, this the part that's highlighted here, it's a string semantic web. Um, then um, how, well, uh, the proposal we have is uh, just, you take the document URI, add a hash, which uh, is a fragment identifier, and then just say offset from 717 to 729. <laughs> Uh, which is, if you look at the HTML source, then you will find the string semantic web at this position. Um, now, if you use this uh, as a web service, um, here it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, you see here, here are just uh, two parameters or three parameters for the, web, for the NIF web services. One is the prefix parameter. So uh, basically, it is here an arbitrary prefix given by the client. Then input is the string as such. Alternately, you can just point to the source, like an information resource on the web. And then uh, you have a demo web service, for example here, the Stanford Core uh, wrapper. And what it does now, the, the tool should return something like this with the prefix here and then just 
um, mark up the, the place here, 717, 700 till 729. Say it, it's type of the offset based string. Anchor off repeats the plain text, and then it says the reference context is kind of like the whole, the content of the whole document. It's a little bit a distinction because it's a string in the string, and not a string in a document. Um, and this here is the URI for the whole uh, for the whole content, which in this kind serves as the context. And you can say that it occurs in the document, and uh, you can also include all the. 26,546 characters as an uh, RDF object property. Uh, now here, the client, of course, could have chosen to give the prefix the same as the source string, then the RDF would look different, and the URI would, would look like this. So this is a choice of the client in this case. Uh, NIF provides uh, two, at the moment, uh, well, the version 1.0 provides two URI schemes. Uh, the first one is pretty straightforward. I already explained it. Uh, the second one is a little bit more complicated. Um, the reason why there's a second one, if you annotate web resources, they might change, and you, uh, it would be nice to have some stability in your annotations or you, so that you can find them, that they stay valid over a longer period of time. So with the offset, every off offset-based method, uh, if one character changes, if the first character changes, um, or there's an insert at the first uh, at the sec uh, zero position, then all the annotations are invalid. So the second one is first you have a identifier which says hash, which identifies the URI scheme. You have a context context length parameter, the string length as such. So semantic web has 12 characters. Then you have a special hash, and here you have the first 20 characters of the of the string that is denoted by the URI. Um, and the hash is calculated by 10, 10, 10 context characters before the string, then the string as such in brackets, and then 10 characters after afterwards. And this is the MD5 hash created here. And of course, then you can just use it as a subject uh, in REF triples. So how you uh, how you fi how would you find uh, the string for the UR for this URI? First, you URL decode the fifth part, which is the string itself, or the first 20 characters. Then you search for all the co uh, occurrences, and then you recalculate the hash uh, with the, you add the brackets and recalculate the ha hash, and uh, see where, where in, at which position in the document uh, it matches. Um, there are some, uh, some comparisons between different URI schemes. Um, the offset one is very similar to RFC 5147. Uh, the problem here was that 5147, the, the request for comments standard, had some optionals. So if you have a Sparkle query, then these URIs, and you add an optional here, like the encoding, then these are not the same anymore, and you would have to do some all same as reasoning, which is yeah, not very scalable. So we created a benchmark to um, evaluate stability. We took uh, 100 random uh, Wikipedia articles, <coughs> with which had over 500 edits. Then we removed the wiki markup completely and tokenized uh, the, um, the, the plain text. And this resulted in about 7,410 tokens on average. Um, and then we, we uh, created URIs for each of those, uh, those tokens. And saw uh, and looked if the URI still existed if in the next revision. So you can see here that um, sometimes with the context length of one, you make the make the MD5 hash about uh, empty space and then the and here, and this has a lot of occurrences. So you can cannot uniquely address a certain the in the text because this matches uh, to a lot of places. So this is why the uniqueness here is very low for the context one and perfect for the offset based method because the offset always addresses only a certain part in the text. Um, interesting here is that context 80 was not the, the highest, uh, context length 80 was not the highest stability uh, and co because context length 40 was, um, this uh, 
Well, if, if the context length is too high and there's a change in the document, the uh, probability is higher that the change occurs within the context, of course. So if you take the context length of the whole document, then each change will also invalidate it. It's basically so, yeah, it doesn't, so raising the context is not, uh, doesn't make the URIs more stable in this case. And also between, uh, if you measure the stability between from the first to the hundredth, hundredth revision of the Wikipedia article, then uh, the context length tenth was the, was the most stable URIs with 78%, which means if you annotate a Wikipedia article and you use a context length of tenth, then after uh, 100 revisions, 87% of the annotations are still, can still be found, retrieved, and stay well. That kind of thing. Uh, yeah, this is a short outlook on the conceptual interoperability here. Uh, this is a vocabulary, vocabulary module of uh, NIF. Um, this is from the ontologies of linguistic annotations. They basically provide identifiers for part of speech text. This is just a very short, short excursion. And if you calculate it, um, if you calculate the number of triples now for the Wikipedia benchmark, it's, uh, well, here are four triples. And then you have 7,000 tokens and times 100 articles. So this, are, this is already 2.8 million triples. Uh, I think this is still quite low, although you always have to be careful to add new annotations. Um, yeah, thanks for your attentions. There will be a demo session tonight during the poster session. Of, yeah. Uh, this will be a uh, vocabulary module, very simple. Every, uh, basically, every NLP domain ontology can be <coughs> included as a vocabulary module. Yeah, okay. No, I, my question was about the, the, the relation between your vocabularies and the vocabulary that's being developed in, uh, you know, the working group. Of yeah, the Ontolex working group, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's very simple. Every, there are, I think there are at the moment five or six different NLP domain <coughs> vocabularies, like Lemon, and they will all become like vocabulary modules. So there's a re, so you can you reuse everything that's existing in this case. So it's already integrated. Yeah, so there's also Apache Stamboll and uh, they use the FISA ontology or so. It's very, yeah. I can, yeah, I have backup slides for that, but um, <laughs> no, I can just tell it. It's, um, we did a developer study uh, with, it, she asked about the, ad uh, the adoption and how easy it is to implement NIF and if it is adopted on the web. Uh, that's basically <coughs> the question, I think. Um, so we did a developer study with the students and they implemented, I think, six wrappers and they needed about, well, they were not skilled in NLP and also had, yeah, where, um, so they needed, it's, uh, they needed like a, between 100 and 400 lines of code in about a week or so. And uh, regarding the implementation, it, the um, NIF, uh, NIF will likely be the, the RDF um, vocabulary for the ITS 2.0, internationalization tax set, it's a W3C, uh, yeah, working group is work, working on this to make this a recommendation. And uh, Apache Stambul has implemented it, for example. Uh, we know actually of five or six uh, implementation outside of LOD2 who have just, sometimes they come to the mailing list and say, yeah, we implemented it. And so that works quite well, yeah.